Open your Bibles to Luke 22. We are going to read verse 35 down to verse 38. Remember the context. We've just come off of the Lord's table. Uh, Jesus institutes the Lord's table. He also indicates that the new covenant is to be ratified in His blood. And we talked a little bit about that in the equip class this morning, about the new covenant. There in the upper room, subsequent to the Lord's table, we see a dispute arise. First of all, the betrayal of Judas. Judas' betrayal is predicted there, and he goes out. But uh, then a dispute arises in verse 24. And remember, we talked about that, uh, the disciples arguing of who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus then foretells Peter's denial in verse 31. And... Uh, he tells him before the cock crows, that is, before this evening, before that evening is out, you're going to deny me, Peter. We talked about that. And now we come to verse 35. Still, same context. Jesus says, When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack, knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, Nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Not a common passage, I think that uh, if you're going to choose what to preach on, I don't think that this is a, uh, a common passage. But it's a remarkable passage. As we're going to see, is within this passage, we probably have the most explicit claim by the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Messiah. Not only this, but we have in Christ claiming to be the Messiah, and the way that He does in this passage, um, we really, what really comes into focus for us is the purpose of His death. We're going to see all that come together in a little bit. Jesus says to His disciples, uh, you remember, I sent you out before. I I sent you out. You didn't need a money bag. You didn't need a knapsack. You didn't need sandals. And did you lack anything? You didn't need to take these things with you. But did you go without? Well, no, we didn't. What is He talking about? Well, Luke 9, verse 1. It says, he called the twelve together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. He says, whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when they leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. And then in chapter 10, he sends out 72 more. And then the Bible says they all come back and they're rejoicing, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. Amazing success. Amazing victory. And they're provided for by God. How did that happen? Well, at that time, there was wonderful favor uh, among the people. Uh, towards the disciples. I mean, they were, I mean, they would come to a town and demons are cast out and healing was taking place and the kingdom of God is being preached. And so they wanted them in their towns. Yes, the power of God has come to our town. And so they would house the disciples and they'd feed the disciples and they'd provide for them. And, and so they could go and they didn't have to bring any provision whatsoever and certainly no protection. Uh, and so God provided for them. That way. They were popular. They were well received and they were provided for. But look at our passage in verse 36. He said to them, But now something's going to change. Let the one who has a money bag take it. You're going to need that. Take a knapsack. Take fill it up with supplies. You're going to need that. If you don't have a sword, you're going to need a sword. Sell your outer garment and buy a sword. You're going to need to protect yourself, possibly. Things are going to get hostile. Verse 37 indicates how this change is is going to happen. Why this change is going to happen. 
What what will bring it about? Verse 37. For I tell you that the Scriptures must be fulfilled in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. See, times are about to change. This Scripture is about to be fulfilled, and it's going to mean change for you as well, and you need to be prepared for the fallout. And so, as I said, here in our passage, though you may not see it on the surface, this is Christ's most explicit claim at Messiahship. He provides for us the clearest understanding of the nature and the purpose and the product of His death right here in this passage. Why do I say this? Because in verse 37 it says, For I tell you that the Scripture must be fulfilled in me, and He was numbered with the transgressors. Well, where does that quote come from? What is He quoting? What is He claiming that His life and these events coming up are a fulfillment of? Well, that's Isaiah 53. And so let's turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. You'll want to turn there. This is where we're going to spend the rest of the morning. Jesus is saying plainly to his disciples, it is going to happen to me as the scriptures have predicted that I will be numbered with the transgressors. And in doing so, he's quoting uh, Isaiah 53. And so everything within the chapter of Isaiah 53, uh, we then can conclude, pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ. The section of Isaiah 53, however, uh, be actually begins in, in chapter 52, verse 13 through 15. And so look at it. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. And many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. Now this is written 600 years before Christ. Whoever this servant is that's being spoken of, something's going to happen to this servant where their body, their form is so marred that they're not recognizable. Such violence is going to be done to to the body of this one uh, that men will want to turn their faces away from this one. Verse 2 of chapter 53 says, And he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form nor majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus Christ claims that this passage is in reference to himself. The indication being that uh, a servant would come. Verse 1 indicates uh, the speaker of Isaiah 53 states, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then he's going to give a stunning narrative of something that has happened. The wording is strange because this is a prophecy, it's a prediction of future events, but it's written in the past tense. Say, who has believed what we're about? This is unbelievable, what we're about to share, what I'm about to share. In verse 2, he grew up before him like a young plant. Who? Well, this is the servant. What does this mean? He grew up before him like a young plant. There's 400 years of silence between the Testaments. There's 400 years where God did not give any revelation whatsoever. And within those 400 years of silence, uh, Judaism upon earth became corrupted. So that when the Lord Jesus Christ came onto the scene, uh, the Uh, The system uh, was one of self-righteousness. It was a works-based system. It was one of hypocrisy. And there, in that context, with a Jewish hierarchy, with the the Scriptures really being concealed, with teaching being corrupted, with self-righteousness being the rule of the day, uh, there, the Messiah came. The servant came. And how did he do it? Well, it says like a young plant. Grew up before him. Before who? Well, this is before God. He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. That is the barrenness, the spiritual barrenness that existed at the time when Christ came. Uh, He shoots up. There's life there. And before God, this is not fanfare. There's not some drama. That's not how Christ came on the scene. But often kind of a small corner, small town, unknown town, unknown woman. A baby is born. Revealed to the lowly shepherds, born in a manger. And in doing so, it confounded all of Jewish expectation and even human desire. And so this servant, the Messiah, Christ claiming this passage, speaking of himself, grows up like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground, uh, springs up out of the barrenness. 
He came in a way which confounded the superficial pride of men. And his ministry would do the same thing. Isaiah 11.1 1 speaks of his ministry. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what, by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. And so the Jews anticipating a Messiah would come. He's going to come on the scene, I mean, just uh, like a king coming to take control of his territory. He's going to come with fanfare. He's going to come with drama. He's going to come with acclaim. That's what they assumed would happen. That's what they were waiting for. But instead, what happened? Just like a little plant growing up, off in the barrenness of the ground, sprouts up. So too, the servant would come on the scene. Why? Because God's going to kill all human pride. God's going to destroy the prideful Jewish expectation. And so, his people would miss his coming. They judged by what their eyes saw. They judged by what their ears heard. And so, they missed the reality that this was the long-predicted Messiah who would come. And so, verse 2 of our passage says, He had no form or majesty that we should look and desire him. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. This is not what we expected. And so the speaker of Isaiah 53, prophesying, but speaking in the past tense, really what he's doing is he's giving us a, a glimpse into what the Jews thought when Christ came on the scene. I mean, this is what, this is what we thought. We, we didn't know. I mean, he was just a root out of dry ground. He just sprung up all kind of off in the barrenness. He didn't come as a king. He didn't come with form. He didn't come with majesty. We, we, we didn't know it was him. There was nothing to look at that said, oh, we desire him. We, we want this. There's no majesty here. It's not what we expected in the Messiah. But there's a, there's a quick leap here. The speaker in Isaiah 53 says, there's nothing there for us to desire him, but then the desire quickly turns to despising him. Verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men. There's nothing there for us. What is this? There's no appeal here. There's nothing here that we would benefit from. And so because there's no use for us, no, no, nothing for us to desire, we despise him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Again, past tense, 600-year-old prophecy. He was despised and he was rejected. Why? Because he came with an offer of salvation, and that offer of salvation uh, was one which confounded human self-righteousness. So John 1.10 said he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. He came with an offer of salvation. He called men to repentance and he was rejected, despised. And our passage says that he was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. In what way was Christ a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief? You know, you see these... You see these depictions of Christ, and he's kind of, you know, almost skips along with a big smile on his face. You know, you watch these movies. and uh, uh, But the passage says that he was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. Certainly Christ had a spiritual joy, but in a real sense, he was forever and always during his earthly ministry overcome with sorrow and grief. Why? Matthew 23, 34 says, Christ says, Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. And here he's pronouncing judgment upon Jerusalem, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. And Jesus says, Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And then he says this, this lament 
O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. See, your house has left you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry was constantly confronted by the reality that his people, the Jews, God's chosen people, were spiritually blind and deaf and rejecting the Messiah. He was burdened by this. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you together? That's the tender compassion and pity and love like a mother over her children, like a hen gathering her brood under her wings. Yet you would not. Christ looked and he saw people like sheep without a shepherd. He was moved with compassion. He saw the blindness of the crowds. He he saw people suffering under the curse of sin. And he experienced their rejection. Luke 19, 41, it says he drew near and he saw the city wept over it, saying, Would that you, that's Jerusalem, even you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Sorrow, acquainted with grief, reminded in Luke 11 when he sees Lazarus, he sees those weeping over Lazarus, and the Bible simply says, and Jesus wept. Why? Because he's seeing the effects of sin. He's seeing people dying in the grief over death and so on. This is not how God would have it. In Gethsemane, in Matthew 26, verse 37, it says, He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. He began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. He says, Remain here and watch with me. Why? Because he knows the cross is around the corner. He's anticipating the cross. He knows of their rejection. He's desiring uh, the Jews to come to repentance. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Besides all that, the rejection of of the people, missing repentance and missing salvation, the, the cross is looming large over his entire earthly ministry. And so in verse 3 of our passage, it says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Go back up to verse 14 of chapter 52. It says, And many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, his form beyond that of the children of mankind. That is, we couldn't help. We could not even look at you. The, the, the scene of the cross was so revolting. His body so wrecked upon the cross that people kind of shuddered in revulsion. Men looked away in horror and disgust, but also they looked away in disdain. Look in verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. That is, we, we looked at him and, and we, we thought, he deserves this. God is punishing him. He's afflicted because God is doing this to them because he deserves it. And so, uh, disdain, horror, revulsion... We can't stand to look upon Him. We hide our faces from Him. We despise Him. They had on multiple occasions sought to kill Him because of His claims, and they accused Him of blasphemy. In John 10, the Jews picked up stones again to stone Him. Why? Because He said, I and the Father are one. And they said they were doing it because of blasphemy. Mark chapter 14 The high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And he said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witness do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And so the Jews look upon Christ upon the cross and they say, he's suffering, but he deserves it. He's a blasphemer. So deserving death God would punish him for his sins. That's their thinking. Shame, horror, disdain. He deserves it. He's just a sinner, a blasphemer, suffering for his own sins. And so the writer of of Isaiah 53 is saying, that's what we felt, that's what we thought looking upon Christ. Far from welcoming the Messiah and bowing before him, they despised him. They rejected him. They esteemed him not, verse 3. That is, they considered him useless, cast aside, like revolting refuse. But again, notice the tense. This is a prophecy looking forward, written in the past tense. 
This is, this is what we thought to be the case, but it's written as if the writer or the, the objects of the writing then look back and say, but now we see something different. This is what we felt, but now we see it. And so Isaiah 53 is written as if a time is coming when those who rejected the Messiah, who did feel this way, would then have the blinders lifted and then they would see Christ in the right context. That's how it's written. And so he writes, stating the manner in which Israel viewed the Messiah and how that sinful blindness led them to reject him, it then begins to show how that veil of confusion is lifted, and Israel would begin to fully understand who the Messiah actually was and what his rejection and death actually signified. And so I think what we're seeing here is really the fulfillment in part of Zechariah 12.10. It says, Now I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me... On him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps over a firstborn. This is a lament. And so the prophecy is looking forward to a time when those who rejected Christ will look back upon Christ and they will realize what they had done and who he really was. So what will they say when the veil is lifted? Verse 4. Surely, we see it now. Surely, He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. We felt fully justified in our hatred. We felt fully justified in our hatred and rejection. Seeing him upon the cross, we just saw a sinner. A blasphemer. He was getting what he deserved. He came with a message that condemned our religious leaders. Condemned condemned all of Israel. He actually spoke sometimes and grouped uh, Jews in with the Gentiles, needing repentance. He confounded our leaders associated with sinners. Beyond this, he tried to make himself one with God. We despised him. And we did so and conceived his self-righteousness. Surely our hatred of him was in service to God, we thought. But what a stark realization dawned upon us as the Spirit of God lifted our blindness And then in seeing his torn, bloody body, it seemed so revolting, we had to turn our heads away. We began to realize that it was not for his sins that he suffered, but the horror we were seeing was the horror of our own iniquities. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. That is, in our spiritual blindness, we looked upon him as he writhed in pain, and we felt no empathy, no pity. He was getting what he deserved, but now we see it. His wounds were wounds for our transgressions. His crushing was for our iniquities. The sin that we despised in him was not his own sin, it was our sin. All of a sudden, it's as if the writer says, our eyes began to see it. He wasn't a sinner. He was a Savior. He wasn't a blasphemer. He was the Lord. He wasn't refuse to be cast out. He was the treasure in the field that was to be sought out and treasured and adored. He wasn't a failed religious leader selfishly selfishly looking for a following. He was the true shepherd gathering together the flock of God. That's who he really was. As God lifted the blindness, Jesus upon the cross transformed from the ultimate villain suffering the just penalty of his own sins into a suffering sacrifice who willingly gave himself for the sins of the very people who rejected him. Could you imagine being a people when that blindness is lifted and all of a sudden the truth comes rushing in and they realize what they had done? They realize how terribly they had gotten it wrong? So they realize he suffered for us. He was our substitute. And so look at verse 5. Again, he was wounded for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. That is, he took our place. He was our substitute. 
2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul tells us, For our sake, He that is God made Him that is Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. So they realize it. He's not suffering for Himself. He's suffering for us. He is our substitute. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With His stripes we are healed. That is, through His death, by bearing our sins and suffering the penalty that rightfully belonged to us, He made peace between us and God. God's wrath was absorbed by Christ, and His wrath was turned away from us. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God, that is, reconcile us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Romans 5.10, For if while we were sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. That is, we are reconciled to God by the death of His Son. So, the, the writer of Isaiah 53 is saying, this is a, this is, this is a prophecy we're looking forward. We know it's a prophecy because Christ's death wouldn't happen for 600 years. It's clearly referring to Christ. Christ claims this passage upon Himself. And, I mean, you've got to be absolutely blind to not see uh, the richness of this, speaking of the death of Christ at every point. This speaks of Christ, gives us the nature, the purpose, and the product of His death. We realize that he's a substitute. The substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ produced peace between God and man. The chastisement that was poured out upon him brought us peace. Why was that peace necessary? Well, the passage answers that question. Why was it so necessary that there be a a substitutionary sacrifice to bring peace? Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The writer has a clear understanding of the depravity of man. And if you're taking note, like if you want to write down some theological terms in the margins, you could do that. You could write down substitute. You can actually write down penal substitution. If you wanted to so far, you could write depravity here, verse 6. Is it that the, the, the sacrifice was necessary? Peace needed to be made between us and God, and He bore the chastisement so that peace could be made. Why? Because we are all sinners. We've all gone astray. Everyone to his own way. Paul picks this up in Romans 3. As is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. And this ancient text in Isaiah 53 nails it. Everyone has strayed from God. What does it look like? Every man doing his own thing. Every man going his own way. Doing as he desires. Living for himself. Becoming his own moral authority. Becoming his own God. This is a far cry from the belief that their privilege as God's chosen people meant automatic entrance into the kingdom. Isaiah say, no. Everyone has gone astray. And and so look at the words here used. Verse 5 talks about transgressions, iniquities. Verse 6 uses the word iniquity, 8, transgression, 10, guilt, 12, transgressors, 5, chastisement. The idea being that we've all gone astray from what? From God's commands. We've all strayed from the holy standard that God has implemented. And so everybody's guilty. All are guilty before Him. All deserve His chastisement. But there's more here than simply pointing out human depravity. It says in verse 6, And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. I mean, this is rich New Testament theology. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And if you want to write down another theological word, write down imputation. Imputation. That is, God the Father took the sins of those who had gone astray and laid those upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Laid them upon the Messiah. He made Him to be sin. And so the speaker sees in Christ's death more than an atrocity committed by lawless men, though it was that. 
You see, it's a divine act whereby God Himself has laid the iniquities of all those who had gone astray upon Christ. What does that mean? That Christ became a sinner on the cross? No, not at all. But on the cross, God the Father as judge declared Christ to have committed the sins of those for whom He was dying. This is a legal declaration. It's the imputation of sins upon Christ. This is, this is so incredibly clear, so inc- incredibly rich. You would think that this is a chapter of the book of Romans. And so the writer sees the imputing of the sins of the rebels upon the Messiah. He also sees penal substitution where he would bear the sins of the world. Christ would incur the penalty for such sin and that God himself would pour out his wrath. Verse 5 again, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Well, who did the crushing? Roman soldiers? No. Verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put to, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring and so on. Penal substitution. He becomes our substitute and he receives the penalty of that sin from God the Father. And so we see imputation and we see substitution. And here's another one. We see propitiation. If you don't want to remember these words, that's fine. Peace was necessary between us and God. The chastisement brought us peace. Yes, the peace was necessary. Why? Because of the sinfulness of man. Separated from God. Because we have incurred His wrath. How was the peace accomplished? God's justice against man's sin was satisfied as he crushed the Messiah. He exercised his full wrath against man's sin upon the Messiah. And in so doing, he receives his death as an offering for the guilt of man. That's verse 10. He has put him to grief. And it says that his soul will make an offering for guilt. So the Messiah satisfied God's righteous anger and turned His wrath away from man. God was satisfied. Verse 11, Out of the anguish of His soul He shall see and be satisfied. And so God the Father pours, uh, takes the iniquities of all those who had gone astray, which is everybody, places them upon the Messiah, pours His wrath out upon the Messiah, crushes Him, and His wrath is satisfied. God is placated. His wrath is assuaged. That's propitiation. 1 John 4.10 And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. That's the significance of verse 6. The Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. What's the language here in verse 6? He's laid on Him the iniquity of us all. What he's doing is he's using, he's invoking imagery uh, from the Jewish sacrificial system. The idea of laying iniquity uh, uh, upon him is the idea like the priest would lay iniquity upon a scapegoat. Luke 16, verse 21. I'm sorry, Leviticus 16, verse 21. It says, And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness, the goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. That's a scapegoat. The picture is, put all the sins of all Israel upon this goat, bring it off into the wilderness, never to be heard of again. The picture is God taking the sins of His people far away. And so Isaiah says this is what's happening, is that the Lord is laying His hands upon the Messiah and placing all the sins of the people upon Christ, but Christ would not be driven into the wilderness to take our sin away, but He would take them into the grave, and He would leave them there. He's the scapegoat. It's a foreshadowing of the Messiah who would come. All the sins of all who would believe would be placed upon Him. But, remarkably in our passage, now Christ is not only the scapegoat, but He's also the sacrificial lamb. He's also the one who is killed and placed upon the altar. Not only that, but He's also the high priest. It all pictures Christ. And so verse 7 says, He was oppressed and He was afflicted, yet He opened not His mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. He's not just the scapegoat, He's also the sacrificial lamb. 
That's why John the Baptist, upon seeing Christ, says, Behold, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the Messiah would not only die for our sins, but according to verse 7, he would do it willingly. He opened not his mouth. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Not a protest. Not fighting back. John 10, 17 says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. And no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Say, I'm doing this willingly. I'm laying it down. I'm going to the cross silently. And this is what happened during his trial, Matthew 27. He was accused by the chief priests and elders, and he gave no answer. And Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things are t- they testify against you? And he gave no answer, not even a single charge. So that the governor was greatly amazed. He's not protesting. He's not defending himself. He's going to the cross, and he's doing it willingly, like a lamb led to the slaughter. Peter quotes this. Peter actually quotes verse 9 of our passage. In 1 Peter 2.22, says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile and return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Incidentally, this is the very passage. Remember that, that scene with the Ethiopian eunuch? And he's in the chariot, and he's reading the Scripture, and he's wrestling with it. Who is this talking about? This is the passage that he was reading. Who, who is this? Who is this man that's going to the slaughter without saying, who is this? And Philip comes along and says, and the Bible says he preached Christ from that passage. So we have our iniquities placed upon the Messiah, he bearing the just penalty that we deserved as those who had all gone astray from God. That's all in this Old Testament passage. That penalty being the wrath of God's towards our sin, that wrath being satisfied as God is pleased to pour it out upon Christ, peace then being made between the holy God and sinful man through the substitutionary sacrifice of the Messiah. That's all Old Testament. That's all in this passage. And you say, well, this is God's plan. He was pleased to do this. He was pleased to crush him. He's the one that laid the iniquities upon Christ. So then men are off the hook. Not at all. There's human culpability here as well. It says, By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for the generation who, con- who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. It says that, and, and it was the will of the Lord to crush him. So are they free from guilt? No. Peter hits this in Acts 2. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. This is God's plan from the beginning. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And then what does he do? He calls them to repentance. You're guilty. It's God's plan. You're guilty. It doesn't remove human culpability. So is that it? Is that all that we find in our passage? Have we, have we wrung all the New Testament truth out of this text? It predicts the Messiah and His substitutionary death for the sins of the world. His crucifixion. Does it stop there? No. Look in verse 10. So far we've seen depravity. We've seen the imputation of sin. We've seen the substitutionary sacrifice. We've seen propitiation. It's all here. In verse 10, we see indications of His resurrection. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Well, what is this? He shall see his offspring. But he's going to die. How can he see his offspring? He shall prolong his days, but he's going to die. The idea of seeing offspring, that's like a mark of the blessing of God. When you can see your children and your children's children, and hopefully maybe your children's children's children, uh, that's a blessing of God to be able to see your poster- uh, posterity, to see uh, your offspring. And it says here that he, he's going to be cut off, he's going to die, but he's going to see his offspring. What is this? This is the result of the resurrection. Contrary to what the normal course would be when one dies, that's it. But he's going to prolong his days. He's going to see his posterity. This is resurrection. 
The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He will accomplish all the will of the Lord. And so his death does not cut anything short. His his death does not stop anything as far as God's plans. Uh, Instead, he will be alive. His days will be prolonged. He shall see his offspring. The will of the Lord will be accomplished. That's resurrection. Is that it? Is there anything else? There's more. We see depravity and imputation and substitution, propitiation. We see resurrection. Verse 11, we see justification. We see the fruit of his death in resurrection. Verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities." Just as the iniquities of us all were laid upon Christ as if they were His, the product of Christ's death and His resurrection is that many would then be accounted righteous. Christ's righteousness then is counted as if it is ours, and so the imputation of our sin upon Him, the imputation of His righteousness upon us. It's right here in verse 11. And again, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. So does it stop there? Depravity, uh, imputation, substitution, propitiation, resurrection, justification. It doesn't stop there. There's more. We see His ascension and His exaltation, verse 12. Therefore I will divide Him a portion with the many, and He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because He poured out His soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Is it, there's, going to be, there's going to be spoil from this. There's going to be uh, reward for this. I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death. That is, there, there, there's going to be fruit. There's going to be spoils of victory as a result of this. Well, what is that? What well, Ephesians 4 verse 8. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, till we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. What he's saying is, he ascended, and upon his ascension, the spoils of victory were what? The Spirit would come, the giftedness would come, the church would grow, the body would be matured. These are the spoils of Christ's death and His burial and His resurrection. I'll divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Are we done? Depravity, imputation, substitution, propitiation, resurrection, justification, ascension, exaltation. Are we done? No. It says in verse 12, Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. He makes intercession for the transgressors. What does that mean? Well, there's a near and far fulfillment. I mean, he did that on the cross. Father, forgive them. They, don't, they know not what they do. He's interceding for them, for those transgressors. There's also a current fulfillment. And the Bible says in Hebrews 7.25 that he ever lives to make intercession for us. So his resurrection brings spoils to the church, the spirit, the giftedness, The church body at large, also his ascension or exaltation places him at the right hand of the Father where now he makes intercession. And so conclusion. Our writer in Hebrews 50, uh, Isaiah 53 is summarizing the attitude of the Jews when Christ died. This is the attitude of the rejectors, the rebels. And so we have God who after 400 years of silence and at a time of spiritual barrenness since his ultimate revelation to the people in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Yet he did so in a way that was unexpected and not desirable to Israel at the time because he came meekly. 
He came with a message which confounded the Jews. They were so inflated with self-righteousness that instead of receiving their Savior and His message of repentance and humility, they rejected Him out of religious pride. They despised Him. They relished in His death. They counted Him as a transgressor who rightly deserved the judgment of God. But the speaker reveals the coming attitude of the Jews as their spiritual blindness is removed, and they consider once again the death of Christ, and what will they realize? That Jesus Christ was the Messiah who went to the cross both willingly and as a fulfillment of God's divine will. They'll realize that there on the cross, God placed upon him the guilt of all who would believe in Christ and subsequently punished him as if those sins were his. They'll realize that Christ was then buried and then He rose again, victorious over sin and death, and distributed the benefits of His victory to the church, God's wrath being satisfied, peace being made between He and sinful man, Christ's righteousness then being given to those for whom Christ died. What a wonderful conclusion. Right? What a wonderful conclusion. You say, well, that just kind of comes full circle. God's faithful to His covenant promises, Uh, Many Jews believe, they understand, they realize who Christ is. Happy ending. Remember, our text is not primarily Isaiah 53 today, it's Luke 22. And so if we go back to Luke 22 and verse 35, Jesus says, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that the Scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. That's the point at which we are. Not the blindness being lifted, not the, not the national repentance, not the being overwhelmed with the reality that we crucified the Messiah, not the understanding of substitutionary atonement. Not, that's not where we're at. Jesus is saying, we're only at that point where I'm going to be despised and rejected of men. That's where we are. I am going to be put upon the cross, my body so beaten that men will want to look, look away. They can't even recognize me as a human being, and, and they're going to feel justified in doing it. They're going to feel that I'm a blasphemer and that they're doing God a service uh, by, by doing that. That's where we are. And, and so what he's saying to his disciples is, this is how they're going to treat me. That's the portion of Isaiah 53 that we're at. And so if they're going to treat me that way, then they are going to feel justified in treating you that way. Whereas before, you could go into a town and they'd welcome you in and they'd feed you and they'd provide for you. Uh, you had no need of protection, things are going to change. They're going to hate me. You're going to be the disciples of the blasphemer. You're going to be the disciple of the transgressor. And so be prepared. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And here it is. It's going to be fulfilled. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. And I, it's such a... I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time explaining this. I, I don't know about you, but I read verse 38, and I feel very sad. I think the disciples are, are I don't mean to be rude, I mean, they're a product of, of the moment, and they're blind. They don't know. They don't, they don't, they don't, at that moment, all of Isaiah 53 is not coming, rushing to them. They don't, they don't get it at this point. Here are two swords. That's their only response. It's sad. Here are two swords. Their only response. That's the, that's the extent of their understanding. He said to them, it's enough. By the way, Jesus was not saying you're going to have to go fight. When they come to betray Christ, when the the guards come, what happens? One of them pulls out a sword, it's Peter. One of them pulls out a sword and cuts off the guard's ear. What does Jesus say? It's enough. Put it away. It wasn't a matter, you know, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. That wasn't the point. It's just, listen, it's it's going to get rough for you guys. And whereas before, you could go and kind of have free reign, you're going to need to protect yourselves. Provide for yourselves. And so although we know the glorious ending of the story, Christ and His disciples are not at the ending yet. They're still at the place where Israel has no desire for Christ. They're at the place where Israel will despise Christ and reject Him. They will hide their faces from Him, see no value in Him. They will deem Him as one suffering for His own sin. That's where they're at. They will think it's happening deservedly. And so things are going to change for Peter, for James and John, for the others. Things are going to be different. They're going to be difficult. The same hatred and rejection 
saying that I'm about to experience as I'm counted a transgressor will be the same hatred and rejection you will face after my death, so be ready. I think it's a reminder to us as we look to a society that's coming off of many, many years of of just kind of accepting Christianity and Christian morality as, as the way of life. We're coming off of that where that's not the norm now. And so Christ once kind of having been received at least on a moral and ethic standpoint, now has got to the point where he's rejected. And I think the Christian church can kind of learn a lesson from, from this passage, like things are, are going to change. Things are different. Whereas before, you kind of had influence, you had political influence, you had cultural influence, and uh, you were kind of well-received. It's not going to be that way anymore. Things are going to be different. Christ is going to be viewed as the intolerant one. He's going to be viewed as the sinner. He's going to be viewed as the transgressor. He's the one that transgresses cultural morality at this point, and we are his people. So guess what? Things are going to be different. Things are going to change. I don't think that's too much of a stretch to see that here. But even then, we know the ending. In Isaiah 53, we understand where that awaits us. And so in closing, just the appeal. The same revelation that happens to Israel in this passage, the the removing of the blinders where they can actually see Christ for who He is, happens in the soul of everyone who comes to Christ. And so I, I trust that most of you have that situation in your life. I had no use for Christ. In fact, I may have despised him. I may have blasphemed him. But God, by his grace, worked in my heart and removed the blinders so that I could see him for who he was. And now I got it. He died for me. It was all for me. God punished him on my behalf. He rose again. Uh, and, and, and you've responded to Christ. This morning, if you have not responded to Christ, let this day be that day. Those blinders are removed. You see him for who he is. He did this for me. Uh, He did this for me, and I'm obligated. I've rebelled against God. I've gone astray. There's a penalty for my sin. And if it's not he who bore it for me, then it'll be me who bears it for myself, which would be an eternity in hell. And so maybe God's doing that. He's lifting the blinders from you, and you're seeing Christ. You're seeing Christ respond to Christ, because that's an act of God's grace in your life. Don't harden your heart against the grace. Respond to it. Say, thank you for showing me who Christ is, And these Jews are waiting thousands of years for that same privilege. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just marvel at the cohesion of the Scriptures. A text written so, so many hundreds of years before Christ. Predicting incredible detail regarding his death, not just physical, earthly details, but such rich theology, understanding your sovereign working, understanding the theology at play as Christ is upon the cross. It's remarkable. It gives us incredible confidence in your word and in your revelation, and we thank you for it. We thank you that you've given such revelation and clarity to those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins that you provided for us in him. We thank you that you counted our sins as if they were his, that you by your grace had a willingness to receive a sacrifice, uh, a substitutionary sacrifice. Not only this, but that substitutionary sacrifice that was offered was your only son. And so at great personal price and cost, you provided for our salvation. Help us not to miss it. Help us to understand the depth of love that you have shown to us through the sacrifice of Christ, your grace and mercy as you held your wrath at bay until the time that Christ would come, your mercy and grace as you received a sacrifice, a substitute on our behalf. And then, Lord, your incredible grace as you poured out upon us blessing upon blessing upon blessing as a result of the spoils of victory that Christ has accomplished. We thank you for this. Help us to know it better. Lord, I pray for those who have not yet received Christ. Lord, they don't see him for who he is. They have objections. They have reservations. They have questions. Lord, I pray that you would lift the blinders 
Help them to see Christ for who he is, the sinless Son of God, the perfect sacrifice, our substitute for your wrath, who died, was buried, rose again, and now ever lives to make intercession. He is both Lord and Christ, and there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd reveal this. Then, Lord, there may be some this morning who are right there at that point. They see Christ for who he is, maybe for the first time. I pray that these would receive Christ, trusting him as the only Savior, submitting to him as the only Lord, and then seeking to live their lives in obedience to him. I pray that you give them assurance in their own hearts that salvation has indeed happened, that you have made them new on the inside on the basis of their faith and the work of Christ. And I pray that their discipleship would be proven to be true as they remain faithful to you. Lord, we thank you for all of this. And Lord, again, we just thank you especially for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for your mercy that you would allow us to see him for who he is. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.